I am now, yes. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear us, Ian? Can you hear us? Yes, yes, loud and clear now. Thank you very much. Um, no apologies, oh, sorry, two apologies uh, from obviously our chairman and also from Julia Rogers, who's not able to be here either. Could I now ask if there are any declarations of interest around the table which are not already known to us through the formal register? No? That's great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, no, I think yeah, I'll um, Items of reference to the appointment of the director of finance. Right. Thank you. We can use it. Um, in which case, could we move on to our improvement story? And um, Push, I think you're going to give us a, a <clears throat> thumbnail introduction and maybe um, um, introduce Ian. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, um, so the subject of PAs is of huge interest to me. It was um, the first cohort of trainees that came to Wales was in 2016. The second year from Worcester, and they came to Swansea and we accommodated them and looked after them. But Can you tell us what the trainees are? So, the, oh, sorry, the trainees are physician associates. So, physician associates are one of the MAPS or medically allied professionals who are designed that uh, their roles are designed to work alongside doctors within the medical model. Um, I'm sure Ian will elaborate on that a bit more. Um, but we started training in Wales, in Bangor and in uh, Swansea back in 2016, and the first cohort qualified in 2018. They are now much more commonplace in the workplace. We find that there's, uh, despite the BMA's misgivings uh, about them uh, replacing doctors, they work really well alongside doctors. And actually, our deanery trainees often benefit from having time to go to training opportunities because of the presence of um, uh, physician associates. And the, the, the other thing about them is that we are encouraging their utilisation or appointments to solve some of our training issues in the areas where there's enhanced monitoring. So all in all, that's a good thing. Um, so uh, Ian is uh, our Director of Medical uh, medical and professional support uh, within the medical deanery. He has a number of roles of which the maps are one of them and particularly uh, there's been some progress with other maps at least in anaesthetic associates. But today we're going to talk about physician associates and some of the really good examples of, of how they have uh, contributed to practice. Thank you. So Ian? Yeah, 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 um, thank you. Um, very much. Um, hopefully you're able to um, see my presentation um, that I've shared with you on my screen now. Thank you very much for um, the introduction um, push. Um, I'm ever so sorry um, that I'm not able to be with you um, doing this presentation um, within T. Dusky, I'm, I've had to sort of temporarily pause my ward round um, to come and um, talk to you. But, you know, I'm really so the rest of my team are enjoying a cup of tea. So I'm that bothered that I've temporarily paused the ward round. And I wanted to talk to you about um, physician associates. As, as Push mentioned, um, there's still a relatively um, new role in NHS Wales. And they're one of four medical associate professions roles alongside anesthesia associates, advanced critical care practitioners and surgical care practitioners. And Push has mentioned, um, I've been uh, leading on some of the work on behalf of HEIW um, with regards to um, further embedding the role of the physician associate right across um, Wales and also supporting um, career progression and career um, development. 
Um, I'm, I'm also delighted to introduce um, to you all today, Laura Davey, who is a physician associate herself, working in an Iron Bevan Health Board, and will be um, showcasing what she's achieved um, since she qualified uh, back in, in 2019 in the second Welsh cohort that qualified. But before I bring in Laura, I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of the physician associate role, because um, not all of you may be familiar with um, the role. Uh, and I also want to showcase two of our other physician associates um, working in Wales, who, like Laura, are really pushing the role of the physician associate, making it very high profile and really doing wonderful things for patients right across NHS Wales. So as Push mentioned, um, the physician associate is a relatively new role to NHS Wales. Um, it's um, more embedded within the workforce in England. Um, the role is probably about 10 or 15 years old um, in England and um, around the rest of the world that are physician associates, sometimes referred to as physician assistants in other parts of the world, working in healthcare right across the world, particularly um, North America. And our physician associates in Wales are highly trained professionals who have been trained similarly to medical students. So very much trained in the medical model of understanding illness in terms of taking histories, doing appropriate physical, um, in, um, physical assessments and investigations, formulating a diagnosis, and then making a plan to treat um, that particular patient. They work side, uh, alongside doctors, um, and in the teams that physician associates work in, um, you know, they become indispensable, I have to say, because of the high level of training that they have. The physician associate course is only two years and people who join the, the physician associate course are required to have a, a two one or equivalent um, science or science related degree before they do a master's degree in physician associate studies. They work right across Wales um, geographically and from a specialty um, perspective, both in um, primary and secondary care. There are still some specialties that uh, we need to embed them in further, particularly my specialty, mental health. Um, and there is a showcase um, to uh, showcase the role of the PA in mental health that we are running in HEIW on the 18th of October. Uh, and you'd be very welcome to join that at the virtual showcase. As Push mentioned, the first graduates from Welsh universities who deliver physician associate studies um, uh, joined the workforce in Wales in 2018. We have two um, courses in Swansea and Bangor. And at the current uh, census, if you like, of physician associates, we have 110 approximately working right across Wales with around 45 and more joining the workforce in just over six weeks um, time. Um, there's been a huge amount of work with regards to physician associates at a four nations level over the last couple of years. Following a public consultation, the GMC agreed that they would regulate physician associates and anesthesia associates. And after that will come um, prescribing responsibilities. So really in a nutshell, um, that is the role of the physician associate, but really to give you um, a more clearer overview of what our physician associates do um, in NHS Wales, I wanted just to um, present a couple of narratives. Unfortunately, um, I would have liked our other physician associates to um, join us today as well to talk uh, with Laura. However, you know, obviously with the various pressures going on uh, in our clinical services, um, they weren't able um, to join us. So I'm presenting um, on their behalf. And the first physician associate, really just to demonstrate the breadth of experience and the, the breadth of specialties that um, physician associates um, can work. And I wanted to um, tell you about Sophie James, um, who is also a physician associate in an iron Bevan with Laura, and she works in, in breast surgery. Um, and, and Sophie, um, in the short time that she's been um, a physician associate, 
is I would suggest already working in a very much an advanced practice way in terms of our day-to-day, -day, her day-to-day -day clinical activities, running triple assessment clinics, follow-up clinics for patients with um, various um, breast conditions. Um, she is often attending um, theater uh, and involved in um, minor and more general uh, surgical procedures and is first assist. So, you know, the technological skills clearly that she has developed uh, in this role cannot cannot be understated. Um, and also she's uh, working with the rest of the multidisciplinary team, such as the breast care nurses, working with patients day in, day out. So, you know, um, in some aspects actually of her work, um, I would say that um, um, Sophie is working very much at a quite a senior um, uh, medical trainee um, level in, in some um, aspects of her work. In terms of her achievements, while she's been a physician associate in breast surgery, um, she's completed um, basic surgical skills courses. These are courses that are targeted towards medical trainees who are following a core surgical training pathway. She's done a care of the critically ill surgical patient course. She was the first physician associate to present at the um, Welsh Surgical Awards in 2022, the very first PA. So really pushing the boundaries and pushing the, what the role can achieve. Um, she is due to start a breast examination and client communication um, course at St. At, at, at George's. And she's also had um, research published at the European um, Breast Care Conference, uh, which is happening this year. And in addition to that, she's developing, you know, she's further developing her advanced practice capabilities by doing an ultrasound um, scanning course and mammogram and nipple tattooing score. So again, you know, really demonstrate in many areas of her work, quite advanced um, practice. The second PA I wanted to talk about is Hayles Hughes, who is working in acute medicine uh, in Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board. Um, Hayles actually um, qualified slap bang um, in during the first wave of the COVID pandemic and initially worked uh, in a rural general practice in Krakiev um, and obviously had to deal and, and, and evolve really at pace with the changing models of how primary care was being developed. Um, so, you know, Laura was very instrumental in that. Sorry, not Laura, sorry. Um, uh, Heliot was very instrumental in that and working, you know, developing new ways of working to support the patients within that rural healthcare practice. This year, um, Hayles has had a move to acute medicine, working in um, Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board in Bangor. Uh, she is involved in the same day emergency service, and her role involves supporting the emergency department and seeing patients with a range of, um, you know, acute um, and critical um, medical presentations. Uh, and in terms of um, her additional uh, achievements, um, she's involved heavily in education, um, regularly teaching the students from Bangor University. And she also coordinates the teaching program for newly qualified PAs who are working in Betsy Cadwallader Health Board. Um, she is involved in various leadership activities, such as the uh, West BCUHB Medical Education Board, and clearly she's sort of taking her career in a more of a research-focused um, pathway, currently uh, developing a post-qualification framework for physician associates working in acute medicine. So that is just a snapshot of some of the wonderful things that what a relatively new role in Wales is actually doing uh, for uh, NHS Wales and for the patients of Wales. And Rather than me continue to tell other people's stories, I want at this point uh, to introduce Laura. Now I taught Laura um, when she was in, doing her psychiatry block back in, I think it was probably 2017, um, Laura, before you qualified in, in 2018. I wanted her to tell you a bit about what she does as a um, respiratory medicine physician associate in Anira and Bevan. So over to you, Laura. 
Hello, thank you all for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's really important to highlight what physician associates do, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Ian. Um, so just to firstly talk about where I started, um, I qualified from the second cohort of Swansea University students in 2019, um, and then following the national examination that um, we complete, uh, which is a part of the whole of the UK, do that. Um, to be able to go onto the register of physician associates. Um, I started in the Neville Hall respiratory team in an iron bevan in that November, um, which, which was absolutely fantastic. I had a real keen interest in respiratory at that time. And then obviously COVID struck us in March 2020, um, which turned everything completely upside down, turned what was meant to be an internship year into um, a very steep learning curve, shall we say. Um, and from there, um, as I'm sure that um, you're all aware of, that Anira and Bevan then opened the Grange University Hospital in the midst of that, um, with um, very little staffing, really, I suppose, to, to cover the site. Um, and we were in the midst of a pandemic, so it, um, it was a very challenging time. Um, I was then sent down to the Grange Hospital um, to continue my work as a respiratory physician associate there with part of my team and part of a new team. From there, I, I complete um, every day, so I'm part of the acute NIV team. So if an NIV call goes out for non-invasive ventilation and call down to assess the patient to see if they're appropriate to be uh, put on to that uh, non-invasive ventilation. And then um, I'm also part of the respiratory high care team, which is on the same ward as the respiratory ward, but just slightly separate. So we do things like PE thrombolysis, um, um, uh, NIV are on there, CPAP, that sort of thing. So quite high acuity care there, um, which I've obviously had to have quite a bit of training for to, to ensure that I'm okay there. Um, the whole hospital model in an iron bevan has, has recently changed and I'm mainly based at the Grange Hospital, but I also do um, a month at the Royal Gwent Hospital, which we've opened up a respiratory ambulatory care unit which I've written the protocols really, especially the PE pathway, that's something that I'm very interested in, in how to assess patients when you're accepting referrals directly from GPs. Um, so working out different scores to say, you know, to either reassure the GPs know that patient is safe according to this score, um, the, the risk is very low of having a PE, or then um, bringing them in to assess them. As part of that service, I see um, expedited urgent respiratory referrals as well. So we carry it to general respiratory hot clinic, um, which is usually three to four patients every morning. And then you see in the acute referrals then in the afternoon. Um, so it sort of, I was one of the PAs to set up that service um, within our health board. Um, I will say I've got two other colleagues that joined um, a year or so after me as well. So there's actually three respiratory physician associates in an iron bevan, and there's definitely plenty of work for all of us. Um, Another interest of mine, as I mentioned, is a pulmonary embolus, so a PE clinic, um, which I do every Tuesday morning in, in joint with a haematology consultant as well, um, which again is fantastic for me, for my learning. Um, I had to do a, a course on DOA counselling and things like that, and obviously learning um, a large amount from my colleagues, including nurse practitioners. Um, so as part of that clinic, I carry out DOAC counselling and um, monitoring of um, anticoagulation levels and then assessing the respiratory side of things about residual breathlessness and things like that. And then referring on to the more specialist things like cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, I'm also part of the PEMDT then along with um, other colleagues. Um, I've also completed a safe sedation course, um, so I'm able to sedate patients obviously which is directly supervised by the consultant conducting the thoracoscopy or the bronchoscopy um, but I'm the only sedationist there um, and I, I do that once once a month roughly um, taking in turns with um, my nurse practitioner colleagues. Um, I'm also part of the asthma MDT which again is another interest of mine and um, so we're, the health board is part of an NCAP audit um, which is just basically about ensuring patient safety once they leave hospital and ensuring they've got their personalised management plans um, so we do all the personalised management plans for people all the inhaler techniques um, all of that sort of thing to try and reduce hospital admissions really and it's just empowering patients to have that knowledge um, which again is I, that's had training from my consultant with the specialist in asthma for that um, so if I go on to the next 
um, this is a bit of a busy slide, so I apologise. Um, I'm also thoracic ultrasound trained. I've got my level one according to the British Thoracic Society criteria. Um, so I'm independent for all pleural procedures. Um, I can insert chest strains, do talc pleurodesis, thoracentesis, diagnostic taps, and tunneled intrapleural, intrapleural catheters, which is a drain that stays in long term and the patient is ambulatory, then they can come back and forth for draining with that. Um, so I had to do a certain number of those to be able to be signed up independent. Um, I cover the plural nurse practitioners if they're on holidays uh, or sickness. Um, and every Friday in Neville Hall, I've got my own plural outpatient clinic then for diagnostic um, things really. Um, I'm NIV trained, as, as I said before, and I've been involved in writing quite a few protocols, especially when COVID came and none of these protocols existed. So it was doing things from scratch, really. Um, I wrote the CPAP in COVID protocol, which was demonstrating to individuals that aren't part of respiratory or um, nursing staff that have never seen a CPAP machine before on how to start um, CPAP in someone with COVID and, and why you need to start it starting from the point of measuring a correct size mask all the way to the end to, to weaning them off the CPAP. Um, also created a patient information leaflet during that time about the importance of proning, turning the patient at certain intervals to help um, the oxygenation um, really. Um, and obviously that was done in a, in a language that any sort of patient could understand as well, which was really important for us. Um, I'm currently in the process of writing our ward-based bronchoscopy um, protocol as well, our standard operating procedure for diagnostic and therapeutic bronchoscopy and um, if people aren't able to expectorate sputum and whatnot, so to be able to do that on the ward at the Grange Hospital. Um, as I said, I've completed a safe sedation course. I'm hoping to go on a more advanced course this year as well. I'm ALS trained, obviously working in the high care unit. That was a mandatory training for me, which I completed last year. Um, I'm able to carry up lumbar punctures and for our sleep patients where um, the body habitus is maybe a little bit larger than your average patient. Um, I'm learning ultrasound guided lumbar puncture currently, which is, is a, a bit of a challenge, but um, we're getting there with that. Um, I've been part of the IMPACT course, um, which is a course for IMT trainees um, to do their paces. Um, and you could have additional um, observers to the course. And unfortunately, uh, someone dropped out. So um, my consultant um, very kindly volunteered me to go ahead and do that. So and I did manage to pass, which I was quite pleased about. Um, I'm quite active in teaching as well. I'm quite passionate about teaching and education. And um, I've, I've been teaching the year one and year two medical students specifically on spirometry, just the handheld spirometry, um, inhaler technique and peak flows and, and about asthma bundles and things like that, because they're the real core principles. If you're not doing the simple things right, um, then the, the more expert things won't be done well either. Um, so I do that on a, a, by a yearly basis. Um, and then when PA students come, um, I, I, we quite often have them in respiratory. We usually have two PA students at a time. So I sort of supervise them on the ward and, and really keen to get them doing lots of fun things. Um, I'm also involved with um, the respiratory high care. There's a new band six nurses that have just started and I'm actually teaching them this afternoon again on PE thrombolysis and acute asthma care. Um, and I'm part of the um, plural teaching um, board, obviously. Um, yes, I was teaching the IMT trainees uh, plural intervention, just simple drains and things like that as well. And um, also interviewing for, for the next cohort. So I, since I've graduated from Swansea, I've been invited back to interview um, on their panel um, and also to interview on your internships for Anaya and Bevan. So it's just a little bit of a snapshot of the sort of things that um, I'm part of, but obviously I couldn't do it without the rest of my colleagues. And I'm just really um, fortunate that um, the department has given me the opportunity and has um, really invested in my training. Thank, thank you, you so much, Laura. And, and thank you, um, HIW Board, for giving us the opportunity to showcase this role. Um, I think that um, this role really has the opportunity, along with the other MAPS roles of really um, solving some of our challenges, uh, particularly in, in the medical workforce. And if we have some time, I'm happy, and I'm sure Laura is, to take any questions, but I also know that we've probably taken up uh, enough of your time already. So thank you very much.
and you know, just saying to Laura, really, that's, that's a hugely impressive list. And um, thank you very much for being willing to, to share it with us, because I'm sure um, it's, uh, it's possibly a bit of an ordeal, or maybe looking at some of the things you've got on the list, perhaps it's just not an ordeal compared with them. Um, and we don't have time today for any questions. Okay. Um, I, I would like to say that it's um, it's really interesting to see how this uh, this role has blossomed from what was a very tentative and somewhat controversial start, um, with quite a few sort of um, um, uh, obstacles on the way. And I think those people who started initially were probably quite brave to to um, uh, uh, trade, blaze a trail for others who've come after. So thank you both so much. We're really grateful. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, Bush, is there anything that you want to say finally to? Is there anything you would like to say to close the item? No, I, I think that's uh, it's a fantastic journey. I remember a lot of challenges right at the start of um, introducing PAs to uh, Swansea. There was real battles with the medical effect. So I was I would personally jump with a. Uh, Seeking. So, um, and to see where they've got to now, and I know many other examples of what PAs do uh, right across the board, uh, that, um, that I'm delighted to see them get to this point, and I think it'll, it'll just carry on now. The door's open, we've got our foot in the door, it's now wide open, I think that there's a huge chance in the future. I just asked by Jonathan about, do we have examples in primary care? Yes, we do, we've got, and we're keeping a real close eye on them, they're in, they're in Haldar. Uh, the ones that we placed from Swansea, and we're doing a lot of appraisals with them to see how they're going. Well, thank you very much for, for bringing it to us, and um, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but maybe we can ask them directly to yourself afterwards. Um, let's um, crack on with the agenda now. So we're going to take uh, the minutes of the AGM, which was held, our, our AGM, which was held at 11.30 on the 28th of July, and I would like to go through them and ask you if they are a correct record. So, if you're ready to go, page one, two, three. Are you content with that as a correct record of the AGM? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in which case, can we move on to the draft minutes of the board meeting, which is actually held earlier on that um, same day? Um, and there are seven pages. So, can we take those for accuracy? Page one, two, three. Four, five, six, and seven. Are there any amendments? Is that a correct record of that meeting? Yes. Thank you. Um, we will move on to the action log. Um, so I think these are all completed, but would you like to? Yes, just, 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 just to confirm that they're all completed and just uh, an update with regards to the invitation to attend the Equality Diversity and Inclusion Group. Um, uh, an invitation will be um, sent out this year, of course, uh, for, for January, which is otherwise it will just be to be. I was just going to say, if it, they haven't come out, that's not, do we need to just amend that? So if it's not a record, if we haven't, so it's not complete. So, of course, in one of the issues in the next meeting of HLW, you don't have to work, you say, first of January. So oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, and the wrong one. Sorry, and the invites have been issued. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, is that, uh, um, Nobody else wants to say anything about the about the action log. 
in which case let's go back to the minutes of the board meeting and uh, we'll go through them for any matters arising starting with page one two three four five six seven No mass arising. I did have one it's just in relation to the point which is raised about the EDI. Just say that I as EDI champion tender meetings regularly and so does Chris Jones as the chair. So we do, you know, I, I'm not saying that the last I do have an issue with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I go back also, because I've been told to me that we need to ask whether there are any matters arising from the AGM minutes. Are there any matters arising from the AGM Thank you. <laughs> um, let's, let's move on to the Chair's report um, and the Chief Executive report. The Chair's report, as you'll see, is one from the Chair. Um, and therefore, um, I could uh, only highlight it, uh, and I'll just pick up one or two things from that which I think may be of interest. Um, but I will take it as read, apart from the actions at the end, which we need to do, which is to ratify chair's actions. Um, so, can I just um, draw your attention to the fact that um, the chair offered his, his office sincere condolences on HEIW's behalf to the royal family. Uh, following the death of Her Majesty the Queen, um, and um, I'm sure we um, are glad that he's done so. Can I just report that? She said that's really an extraordinary example in public service, and, um, and she was a huge supporter of the National Health Service for decades, but particularly so over recent the recent years with. The pandemic um, and all that that's involved. I'm sure we won't forget it. Um, secondly, I've been able to um, cover several of the meetings that were in Chris's chairman's diary for him. Um, so I just report on one, which was the meeting that the chairs had of NHS Wales had with the minister, which was last week and say that that was um, an interesting meeting. Um, the minister <coughs> was very keen to express her appreciation of the huge efforts that staff have been making across NHS Wales to respond to the current extraordinary pressures. Um, also mindful of the fact that we've yet to face the winter months um, and we're not um, sure but somewhat apprehensive about what that might have in store in terms of illness. Um, she was also um, keen to emphasize the role of performance management within a governance and accountability structure, or our governance and accountability structures, um, as an important tool for handling some of our challenges um, and mentioned that um, there is work to do to improve the data which underpins our performance management processes that she will want to be focusing on this as time um, moves on and um, pretty promptly, I think. Um, the third thing I wanted to um, just pick up is um, something that I did, which was when I went for it you know, to the uh, National Centre at Shrigaran in um, the beginning of August and um, was there for Minister's launch of Muinagalia, which we're going to be discussing later on the agenda today. Um, so that was a, a, a very a cheerful meeting. Um, lots of people there. David was there and Hugh. Um, and much enjoyed the good audience. Um, 
Um, and finally, uh, to say that um, Alex kindly attended the vice chair's meeting recently with Dr. Esther Lomas um, to <coughs> report to, to vice chairs on multiple well, a multi-professional education and training framework that we're currently um, developing um, for primary and community care. And that was very well received. And in fact, you were invited back. So that was um, was outside. <laughs> um, that was a very positive event. And I believe you had previously been to address the chairs at the um, chairman's request on the senior leadership and talent management program, which we're currently also seeing on, on the agenda today. Uh, so with that, can I take you to the action that we need, which is to ratify the various um, requirements for chair's action and chair's action, which has been taken during the past few weeks. So we have three and um, the first is to approve or to ratify the action which was taken on the 20th of August for Welsh, Welsh Government circular on pay to be implemented immediately for all staff. And this was um, actually discussed and supported by the Remuneration in Terms of Services Committee at its meeting on the 25th of August, but it required board approval um, and that's what I'm asking you to do is to ratify that. Um, secondly, <coughs> the requirement um, which was met on the 13th of September by Chair's Action to implement an additional public holiday for HERW staff on the 19th of September for the state funeral of and finally, on the 14th of September, Chair's action was taken to approve the proposed recruitment of the Director of Finance, Planning and Performance, which was also supported initially by the Remuneration and Terms of Services Committee on 25th of August. I should add that in all those uh, instances, the um, agreement of two board members were sought in line with standing orders. Thank you very much. And, and with that, I think I'll pass on to Alex. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so um, I'm happy to take any questions about the report that's on the agenda today. Um, just wanted to pick up a few extra points really just to, <coughs> to update the board. So, Obviously, in the introduction, um, I referred to the situation that um, we're currently facing across the NHS, and I think it's really important to just reflect on that for a minute, because um, certainly the national conversations that we're involved in um, are clearly dominated by the service pressures that are facing our NHS colleagues at the delivery end um, and the financial context, um, which is really, really challenging this year as well. Um, so, you know, we're always um, conscious of that in HOW that our role is to really work with the other parts of the NHS and to try and support them as much as we can with those challenges. Um, you know, in the short term, sometimes we aren't able to do as much as we would really, really like because obviously our levers and our um, assets are more focused on that medium term and, and longer term solutions. But um, nevertheless, it's really important that we're alongside them and responding to any of those things that they think will help them in that short term. And two of the particular pieces of work um, that we're, two of the mechanisms we're involved in, one is um, a piece of work that's going on jointly um, across local government and the NHS to look at how we can really support an injection of community capacity for the winter. Um, Carol Shillabia has been leading that work from an NHS perspective, but we're also working um, alongside with government colleagues in Social Care Wales. So Julie um, and her team have been instrumental in looking at the workforce issues around that agenda, very much tied in with our workforce strategy. Um, and also um, the Welsh Government are, have established a fortnightly winter resilience meeting 
that we also involved in along with uh, other colleagues across the NHS um, in anticipation of the challenges that you know are already with us really um, that are potentially um, going to get worse as the winter progresses really so we are also tied into that mechanism to pick up any of those workforce uh, asks and requests that we can um, and support where possible but um, yeah, it's, um, it's really dominating all the conversations at the moment um, in terms of that short-term focus and really working together to get through uh, the next couple of months will be, will be critical. Um, the other things just to pick up on are um, in terms of, um, there's an item there just um, telling you about some of the work that we're starting to do on developing these strategic workforce plans. So we've seen the mental health one, and obviously we've approved that, mm -hmm. and we're just waiting <coughs> to the details of the launch of that plan in early November. But from that, we've developed a sort of a methodology, if you like, as to how we would go about um, developing a similar approach in other key areas. So in our IMTP for this year, we've got nursing, um, dental, and uh, pharmacy. So, um, We've done that and we are now applying that methodology. Um, but what I'd like to do is to bring back a paper to our next um, board meeting to really update you on all of those pieces of work um, because they are really critical. Um, just going back to where I started from in terms of the workforce challenges we're seeing at the moment. Um, and in particular, yesterday, um, we may have seen the RCN report on nursing numbers. Um, and clearly, the nursing workforce plan is going to be absolutely critical to um, making sure that we know exactly what the plan is that we need to be delivering um, from the HOW perspective with our partners across the NHS government and our professional body colleagues as well. So that's going to be a really important piece of work. So I'd like to um, bring that back for more, a more detailed update in November. We are continuing to work um, hard with the national programmes. Um, so again, some of this is about workforce solutions more than you know, strategic workforce plans. Um, and as you can see, we are plugged into many of those national programmes that are dealing with some of those big service challenges. Um, diagnostics is probably the most recent one to be established, and that's trying to develop a coherent approach across pathology, imaging, endoscopy, and genomics as well. And we're already very much involved in those areas of work. Um, so anything from um, supporting um, clinical endoscopy training, for example, in Wales, to um, some of the um, workforce uh, development we're doing around the imaging workforce. Um, but we haven't been perhaps as plugged into the genomics work as we um, needed to be. And yesterday, um, Kush, myself, and Sarah Bant, our Associate Director of Health and Science Transformation, went to the All Wales Genomics Partnership Board, uh, which is chaired by Susan Mankin, who's the Chief Executive of Health and Wales to start the conversation about you know this is perhaps not something that's going to happen next month but the impact of genomics on how we deliver care is clearly going to start accelerating in the next 10 years so how do we really work with them to understand the workforce implications of that um, and make sure that we build on some of the foundations we've already got around that so that work again will be something of interest to the <coughs> development session um, later on in the year um, and again, just opening um, all of the sort of doors that we need really from the HOW perspective to make sure we're, we're contributing um, to the right um, things. Um, and just, I think the final point from me um, is to um, just note that, oh, sorry, but there was another one, Cardiff University. We went to the uh, meeting with the Vice Chancellor last week, didn't we? Um, so that's, um, as you know, we agreed that we would extend our interface with our um, higher education um, partners by uh, seeking meetings with vice chancellors and their teams <coughs> to have a more strategic conversation rather than just looking at things through a commission interface. So um, the chairman and I, and um, fortunately, was able to also attend the meeting of Cardiff University last week. Um, so we've nearly finished those now um, and they've been really helpful, really good conversations around much broader issues like um, you know, the foundational economy um, and how we can work together and what the strategic drivers are facing them as organisations as opposed to perhaps just the health professional courses um, and when we finish those visits again we'll do a summary of what some of those key themes and findings have been um, to have a conversation with the board but um, those are um, going to be really worthwhile at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so what to bring some of the, the, the 
key issues from those meetings together and yes, I to the board for yes, updates. I think it'll be really helpful. We'll have to step down in the plan. I think we've got a couple more to do in November uh, and then we'll be able to um, have a bit of a reflection on that. I think people have been very welcoming of having these engagements and certainly um, uh, generally speaking have welcomed the, the idea of doing that on an annual basis to just keep in touch and make sure we do have that broader conversation. Um, and certainly when you think about you know link making the link with genomics and where that might take the ripples in the future actually broadening out our reach from just the health professional programs is going to be really really important so. and then the final thing just to um <coughs> note that tonight is the women's fire awards that Clara and Teg, um sponsor uh, we sponsor an award in that for women in health and care uh, last year, if you remember, um, Dr. Nar Talibani was the winner of the health and care category, first time we sponsored it, and she actually won the overall winner as well last year, which was great. So, um, and for the first time, Helen and I got actually going tonight to present awards in person, which again feels like a real breakthrough, doesn't it, in terms of where we're at. Um, and we're going to um, actually, uh, we've got four nominations this year. Um, so you can tune in online. Um, it's on ITV Cymru, I think, um, online. So uh, seven o'clock it starts. It's this fantastic celebration of lots of really great examples of excellent um, achievements right across you know, all different sectors, really. So it's a very inspirational event, which is why we've got involved. Really. So please tune in. I'll try not to flip my lights. <laughs> I have to take questions on anything else, and some of the, yeah, some of the items. We haven't got a great deal of time, but if there are any points, let's have a look. Um, just, yeah, sorry, I'll make it really quick. Um, and it's really about um, supporting everything that you said in terms of um, the current sort of challenges and having to help and all the rest of it. How are we going to continue to balance our strategic? vision against sort of being dragged off into all sorts of little corners with pressures. Mm. It's how how can we keep our heads when <laughs> everybody else might be losing their hormones? <laughs> and I, I think we've gotten better at that over the last couple of years because I think that the experience of COVID helped us realise when we could help and when when we were going down a blind alley. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think that um, we are we are better at that. Um, but nevertheless, as we say, it does does bring extra extra pressures in, extra work. But you know, everywhere is pressurised, so um, you know we need to share our our part of that really. So I think um, between Julie and myself, we try and make sure that we're realistic um, and make sure that the conversation is focused on what's the object possible in the short term, rather than <coughs> we can get quite, quite carried away with. Oh, you know, we can do lots of different and exciting things, and we're much better now at saying no. Let's stick to the the actual ask at, at this time. So, in terms of the winter, you know, what are the things that can make a difference in the next six months? If they're not in that six months, they are part of our strategic work, and we're getting on with them anyway. So, um, that's um, yeah, we're a little bit more experienced in this way. Great, Jim. Um, yeah, just two points really. One is that um, I did have an invitation to come tonight to uh, share, but I'm driving and I will be watching, so thanks for that. But uh, I think that's really good to know because engaging most of the team here uh, participating and start the start of conference is a different place on. Yes, I'm really sorry, good point. Yes, yeah, so the um, start of conference is in the organization center. Yeah, because there, there are some uh, stands and we're in the open so maybe there are some members that will want to attend. The other thing that I, I wondered about was the more than just words, and I think it's important to mention this, that listening in the EDI um, component parts of the consultation, there was a lot of emphasis, I think, that was coming forward on um, not tick boxing, but actually sharing world culture as well as world language in education. And I think that's important for us from the perspective of our contracting going forward, that when we're recruiting international students, that whilst Welsh language is vitally important, so is the culture of Wales. And um, I was particularly moved by some of the comments that were made at that um, meeting, so that both health and social care were saying how important that is. And I think from a health and social care component part, I think we could think about that going forward. I know it's mentioned in the report. I think it is significant. There was just so much of it coming forward in the UPR. I think it's worthy of a second. 
I would just say on that point, um, Tina, I did the um, Academy of Wales run um, uh, leading a bilingual organisation programme just before COVID. Um, and it was very much about that, you know, what does it mean to live in Wales, to work in Wales, to be understand Welsh history, Welsh culture, as well as then the importance of the language in that, in that context. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, can we pick this up when we get to Bunagaria? Is it some point? I think I should really work out where quickly. Yeah, the point is, your points are, they were made, Tina, and in the new context of being introduced to all that sort of programmes, and who is introduced to it? There is a dedicated program of work which you introduce not just the Welsh language, but the Welsh culture. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend that you mm -hmm. see it and what, what that actually sort of um, presentation is all about. And it does go all about that culture. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous because then we're we yes. listening to the people we're consulting with. Yes. Um, it was incredibly important to start with and get <coughs> the education. That was a good <laughs> And John? Thank you, Chair. Um, Alex, you referred to the methodology in terms of developing strategic workforce plans. Can I suggest that, that the executive team consider, as part of that methodology, clear milestones to those uh, strategic plans and timelines with what we perceive as success outcomes? I think we need to raise down what we're expecting and when, <coughs> particularly for more assurance in delivery. Thank you. Yes, so the, chief, uh, the uh, director of the NHS Confed in Wales said that um, challenges in social care were problematic and that we had too many people in hospital not able to do. There are many reasons why there are uh, why there are huge demand pressures in the system. And I'm just wondering what are your chief exec colleagues saying to you about the range of pressures? I'm thinking about the numbers of people ending up in AD, the numbers who end up in hospital who could be cared for outside of hospital. Um, but it was with the different demand pressures that are all contributing. But do they get a sense of what what the extent of those contributing factors are? Because it's not just one end of the system, is it? Yeah, I think there's um through the work that Carl Shelby has been leading over the summer, which was um generated from um a chief executive conversation and an NHS leadership board conversation, there's been um, a lot of data capturing where the bottlenecks are across the system and what the reasons for that are. And that's very much informing the work that's going on at the moment. Um, and hence why it's very much a joint piece of work across the NHS and local government, because as you say, people are waiting in various parts of the system. Uh, and sometimes we just see the bits that we can see in our part, but we need to look at it as a, as a whole system. Otherwise we just move the deck chairs around. So um, yeah, there's, you know, there's, um, there's quite a comprehensive piece of work um, that under underpins that that's been regularly discussed at all the right um, meetings and also feeds into the community um, action committee that the minister chairs. Okay. Thank you, Alex, for a um, really interesting report. We can carry on talking about it, but I think we should move on. Um, so um, we're going to move on um, to leadership and succession for the minister. I'm going to go to the first, which is that I have permitted to welcome John Cam to his first formal, formal meeting of the board. Um, and um, it's great to have you with us. Um, I hope you feel very welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, <coughs> um, um, now, ask Helen, you. You've been asked at the last minute yes, to yes. Uh, present so, um, this paper, which is for the board to know, which is basically an update and an overview of what's happening with leadership and the succession program. So we did have some slides to show, if that's okay. Yeah, I um, think or, yes. Can we keep? Can we? Can we make the um, uh, very sound assumption that everybody will have read the papers um, and that we? Need to keep this as brief and succinct as possible. Yeah. Um, and just to explain, um, Julie did come in this morning, so I sent her home. Because um, um, for her own well being and for our too, it takes a big room with her. So um, Helen's um, helped us out at the last at the last minute. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. <coughs> I need to walk up there. This <laughs> is so bad. I won't be to see what I'm saying. And the, and the reason for bringing this to the board is as well. Um, 
uh, that um, we have had this since we've been updating chairs, chief executives on this agenda recently. So we thought it was really important to um, bring an update to the board as well because this this group is so um, obviously a really important foundation that many things still trying to aspire to. <laughs> I thought you were going to do it if you made a system like that for them. So, yes, first thing to note, I'm not Julie, but I'm standing in for Julie. So I'll, I'll try and make this very brief, but hopefully give some life to the paper that you've already received. Happy to ask, uh, answer any questions later. Uh, just to give it some grounding and context, really, our workforce strategy for health and care and wage you'll be familiar with. It's three years in, pretty much. Um, so we've got seven years to achieve our objection, um, objection, our ambition that by 2030 leaders across health and care will be collective and compassionate leaders. And we had three levers to help us do that in the first three years. The first lever was about having a consistent strategy. So what is the leadership strategy we need for complex adaptive systems such as health and care, which become our, our compassionate and collective strategy. Our second lever was around an open and accessible range of materials, resources, et cetera. So anyone at ever any level could commence their leadership journey because leadership starts with everyone. And our third lever was around succession planning for tiers one, two, and three. So just to give it some background, this is where we started. And I'll talk about the progress we've made in the last six months that builds on, if you like, the last two and a half years. But one thing I wanted to note was our compassionate leadership principles because our seven principles create the conditions for leaders to create that environment, that collective compassionate environment across health and care in Wales. I won't read them, but you can see that as compassionate leaders, we will improve equality, diversity, inclusion, etc. So what we've been doing is saying, yeah, that's great, that gives us a route map, but we need to give individuals resources and tools to help leaders and managers create these environments. So we're currently working, so when you click on one of the buttons, that will open up into toolkits, resources, webinars, podcasts, and other resources that will help leaders and managers create these conditions that we retain our staff because they're working in effective teams, they're working in inclusive environments, and they have the opportunity to develop and become competent in what they do. So most recently, with engagement, we've just slightly updated the language and we've made self-compassion and health and well-being a core component of our uh, leadership principles so we will go and socialize this get some feedback and then we will just relaunch if you like the updated ones that reflect where we are three years later but built on the foundation of 20 30 years evidence base and we know that compassionate leadership increases staff satisfaction increases staff engagement and therefore increases patient care and the quality of services we know that poor leadership leads to work overload, high stress, and high, high stress leads to high sickness and poor outcomes for our patients. Um, so it's all built around a huge evidence range that, uh, that you'll probably be aware of, so I'll, I'll just move back on. So some of the things we've been looking at then, um, against those three levers, if you like, is uh, succession planning for tiers one, and that's our aspiring executive directors. So in 2020, we opened down a talent pool, which is around our aspiring executive directors, and invited individuals to join them, in, and we supported a number of individuals during that process, and I think maybe eight or ten individuals have actually moved into an executive director position after being part of our talent pool. But we also noted was our talent pool was not diverse, it was not inclusive, and I guess it was uh, tall poppies as opposed to looking wider across our upcoming um, executive talent. So for our 2023 to 25 aspiring talent, we'll be going to do things differently. We've got software that helps us be inclusive. We're going to market extensively the ability or the opportunity for individuals to join our aspiring executive talent pool. And we're going to make it self-service and inclusive, as well as nominated from managers, etc. So hopefully we'll have a diverse range of individuals applying for our talent pool, which we will then scrutinise to ensure that we've got organisation priorities reflected, professions reflected and diversity reflected in this talent pool. We've increased our talent management software so we can scrutinise this and we can target interventions if we need to change some of the populations in our talent pool. And then we'll be invited individuals to participate in executive development centres. 
we have an executive success profile we'll do the development centers that will align to our success profile and enable individuals to come out with real-time feedback reflections and a customized approach to the next steps that they need to do in their development to move into an, an executive role it's not about sheep dipping it's about looking at what experience they bring with them what diversity and lived experience they have and then what is their next stretch if you like supported by their organization for experiential opportunities and feedback there so we'll offer a range of developments based on the outcome of these development centers so it's more scientific and evidence-based this time uh, offered experiential opportunities and hopefully um, we'll have then successful appointments and certainly aligned to our succession strategy which is three shortlisted uh, NHS individuals for all the executive roles that we advertise in NHS ways. So we've been successful last year, we want to be more successful but certainly more inclusive this year and this is our approach which has been socialised with our National Talent Board. We are very, very excited, at least I am, but that could be because I'm sad, around our talent <laughs> management software. Sorry, Helen, I think the public are having trouble seeing your slides. Oh, OK. Yeah, I don't think they can see your slides. I think they can just see Ian's. Okay, so yes, just to give you a quick update on our talent management software, 23rd of October, D-Day, it's going into our live environment. This is going to give us a number of things. It's going to give us enhanced registration so we can capture EDI information, perceived readiness, career ambitions, we've got intelligence around who wants to go where, the experience and the diversity. So we'll have that visibility. We'll also have visibility on how they match up against success profiles. So where are they now? What are the gaps? And we have some outputs, which will enable us to determine in our talent pool where we have maturity of competences and where we don't. And that again will give us that targeted intervention, that intelligence to put something on that requires or meets the requirement of individuals within our talent pool. And lastly, which is really, really exciting, is our self-assessment and 360 degree assessment. So what that will allow us to do is make uh, self-assessments available on Weckler so you can look at the success profile and measure yourself. Where do you think you are? But even better, you can press a button and get that to go to your manager, your peers um, and your team and get them to assess you on how you show up in work. And that can be done against competence success, success profiles or values. For example, HAW values. We have statements under all our values. It'd be great, wouldn't it, to be able to just say, how did my team see me showing up in work and living these or not? So there's a huge number of things that we have available. And as you can see, it gives us a bit of a spider diagram. So you can see where you plotted yourself and then the amalgamate of where others see you. And that gives you some really insightful, I think, feedback. But there's more that will also then give you links to resources on welfare and opportunities where perhaps you want to increase your level of competence. So that will give you a, a report that will give you links in to other resources and signposts as well. So I'm so excited about that. So that's happening soon. The other thing that we are going to be uh, moving quite fast or quite quickly on is the aspiring chief executive development program. So we've had conversations with the talent board and um, presented, if you like, um, an example of what this could look like. Uh, it will be matched against the executive success profile and it will include executive education, um, a, a consultancy exchange so we can link with our colleagues and our chief executive programmes across Scotland, provide executive mentoring, resources on Gwetla, psychometrics, peer accountable groups, and then things like fireside chats that I spoke to you about a year ago, Tina, and you gave some really good examples of how that could be brought into some of this. So that programme is uh, currently being worked through and we are currently waiting for nominations back from organisations with their aspiring chief executives to commence this programme, probably January 12 month programme. So working behind the scenes on <coughs> just putting the details behind some of this for another exciting offering from HEIW. And then, I'm sorry, I'm looking at that clock, it hasn't moved. <laughs> okay, last thing. Sorry, I was taking my time then. So, um, yeah, with regards to inclusive 
talent management, we, we did a survey across NHS Wales based on the foundations of effective talent management. And each organisation self-assessed themselves as per their expertise and readiness. And you can see there's a lot of red in this area. So what we did was created and consulted to, uh, to produce a programme, a talent management programme for NHS Wales. We've gone through all the modules in order them to make sort of progress in this area. We concluded module six uh, last week, really successful in-person um, event. And that's resulted in us having national and standardised talent management tools for NHS Wales to make it consistent and inclusive, as well as having the talent management software available, which each organisation was almost as excited as me about. Running out of time, so I just want to highlight there, we've got our graduate programme, really successful, 22 individuals currently on there, and we will start recruitment this quarter for our next one. And our internships, we did our second HAW internship programme, we doubled the numbers from the first year, and we've offered four individuals year-long experiences. So that is bringing talent into our system, as well as retaining our talent through our leadership and culture. Just going to highlight you in a couple of our programmes, our Clinical Leadership uh, Fellowship is one of our flagship programmes. They've just commenced the programme and we are now recruiting to the next year. And there's a whole range now of clinical and executive leadership programmes that we run from HEIW. So almost two and a half years since starting, we now have some tangible programmes and offerings. And most, um, most recently, we've upgraded Gwekla. So it's had a facelift, we've listened to feedback, and we've now got a nice simplified approach to Gwekla, where you've got a leadership vision, start your leadership pathway. So whatever profession or individual or, or level you are in the NHS, you can click on that button and it'll give you all the leadership offerings that you can progress or participate in. There's our executive talent there and our resource library, which has got numbers and a huge range of credible resources. It's available bilingually as well, and it's used nationally by our universities, but also by our UK colleagues. So I'll wrap it up there in the speed, because yeah, I don't know how long I've had. Two minutes gone. Your presentation skills from a from a no um, uh, in from, yeah, no request till this morning start are, are, are stunning. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Um, Alex, do you want to come? In? Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, so um, I just wanted to just recap board members who perhaps haven't been with us since the start, but um, four years ago today, we didn't have anything in terms of leadership. There was nothing. We, we were asked by um, the then Director General to establish a leadership presence and development function for NHS Wales, and um, we were very much the Cinderella of the UK in that regard. Um, and we both filed in steel, and um, Helen came in quite quickly after that. And, um, you know, we, we, we only have a limited unit. We don't, you know, we're not in charge of the leadership for every organisation at every level. You know, we, we focus on those all Wales added value offers that we can we can develop. But very very quickly, it's becoming absolutely apparent. That, and we, we did say this at the start: if it's good enough, people will come and people will want it. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. Actually, the team can't do things quickly enough to satisfy the demand that is coming through the door on this because. Um, every professional lead in Welsh Government, every peer group, every network, um, every national programme all want a bit of this because they can see the value that that has. And I think we would all accept that, you know, whenever we're looking at workforce solutions and workforce plans, leadership is a cornerstone of them all. Uh, and the team's doing a great job of, um, you know, keeping on top of all of that and juggling all of those balls. And developing, I think, some really, really good products. So um, still an awful lot more to do. Um, and we're very aware of that all of the time. Um, but um, yeah, I just wanted to put that in context really that um, this was one of the one of the newbies for us as an organisation. Thank you. Okay, this is um, cross a note. Um, but other quick comments I've been watching. Um, let's go around the other way then. Um, John? Uh, let me just a quick point on this. I, and I think this is a fair feed ambitious collaborative program I think that should be applauded. We can see it's absolutely excellent. Uh, for us as a board, we need to demonstrate value. And I think the papers that we get here, we need to see well, what does that mean in terms of measurable outcomes. We've steered some of them, but I think we need to be quite clear about that, that our investment as a board in this for Wales 
what does it mean? I mean, and it would be helpful to see if, you know, you talk about 23 to 25, you, I would want assurance that by X amount of time we will deliver this, these will be the outcomes. So similar to my last point, that we're demonstrating impact by what we're doing. Well, that line is be helpful to have some metrics um, with regard to success. So that I know where you need to come from, but I wonder how, and I'm not saying that as I know it all because I don't because you see this, but some metrics and um, where they are <coughs> so that we can actually either celebrate what we're doing. And the other thing for me is how do we get feedback? Um, so some qualitative measures about the success um, for managers themselves and from organisations that we used to have qualitative statements in relation to that. Thanks. Yeah, um, I am measuring success as one of my questions as well. Um, just, I mean, absolutely taking us red is absolutely fabulous stuff. So really, really well done. Um, two questions very quickly. Who else is in the space still? And how are we working with them? Because there's a lot of leadership programs across all sorts of bodies. And a little bit more about how do we attract um, into it from outside the NHS? Because I'm passionate about people moving between sectors. Um, and I, I'm not saying that you know, we're at that stage yet, but, but it can become very insular. So how do we work to get talent into the NHS, from either outside the <coughs> or from other sectors in Wales? Pick up the, um, so one of the key players that we obviously work with is um, Social Care Wales, but also Academy Wales, um, and they've been having a bit of a refresh. They've got a new um, uh, new lead, uh, Alexandra. I can't remember a second name, but I knew it's same first name. Um, <laughs> who um, I've met with um, a few times, and we're having a joint meeting um, between our team and their team in the next couple of weeks, actually, to make sure that we're not. In each other's space, yeah. and that we're, and that's not to say we shouldn't navigate people to use their services and to get permission from them, and we can commission from them, and equally want them to navigate back towards us as well, so that we can coordinate that. Um, and I think in terms of the you know, the broader sector input, um, I think all of these programs lend themselves to that. I think um, in, in particular, some of the um, learning we've had from um, working with um, the exec mentoring scheme that we did with Tracy Myhill was in particular, um, from a slightly different angle, what people who are coming into the NHS in Wales need to also learn um, in terms of leadership, because it is a different environment to work in. So how do we make that more accessible by building that into some of our leadership programs as well? But obviously employers have got a big role there too, because we train and develop the people that are in employment in NHS Wales. And so, you know, making sure that those jobs are accessible from an employer's perspective is, is just the key thing. Can I just add to that, that very quickly, the senior leadership experience is something that was originating in um, the Hadley Ways. We collaborated and we expanded it in partnership between us across NHS Wales. That's just one example of working together. <coughs> Very much enjoyed the conversation. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. One quick, quick question, uh, Chair, if I can. It was in relation to the other paper, uh, in terms of the, the other major work that we're doing around supporting uh, people within the service. Can I say, I, I think the more we can do around our own HRW internship programme is fantastic. It shows that these organisations are the elite, it's the right thing to do, and that we really keen to see what the impact of that is going forward. Secondly, on the National Graduate Management Programme, 300 applicants and 22 placements. Um, do we need to find more placements? Because obviously we're getting a large number of people applying for the, for the programme itself. Does that mean that some people weren't up, up to it? Or was it that we had lots of talented people, but just not enough places for them to access? I mean, I think it's generally been like that since I was a graduate trainee. I can really? remember there was a number of 450 applied and there were nine places yeah. at the time. So um, it's, I think it's similar to a lot of graduate programmes, really. So I think 22 is actually 
quite an increase on what we've done previously. And if there's an appetite from organisations, then certainly, um, you know, we could look at that. But that's a quite a good cohort, the number of 22. So we need um, to build that, that capacity. Too. Yeah. So we've, we've run the programme once. We just commit it now to, because that was kind of a, almost just proof, proof of concept, get it right. Um, so we didn't advertise for this year. To, to repeat it, but we will now be going out now in future years every year to do those 22. And we need to make sure as well that people are going to give them employment at the end of the programme. Um, and that's and that's key really because we don't want to be attracting lots of people and doing graduate programmes and then they don't have anywhere to go with really. it. So yeah. And it's go quite on. expensive. Sorry, go and move on. Go and move on then. Uh, but I think you've had a designated endorsement um, yes. on, on the board, but we will um, be very interested to see and what comes next, so please keep us informed. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. all. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got iron and um, this is also an update. Um, yeah, and I think we can again take it for granted that the book, the papers will have been read um, and then really digested. So I don't think we need a presentation. Um, the focus in here is for us to approve uh, the timeline principles. Um, and the finance plan. Uh, so th those are the things we particularly need to make sure that. Yeah, so um, the approach to developing the finance plan and, and the approach to developing the yeah. utilities and the okay. So, um, yeah, so the planning approach is, is set out in the diagram under 3.1. So that top down, bottom up approach um, is very much seen as um, the way forward in terms of developing an evidence based. Um, a strategic plan and um, the timeline for development <coughs> is set up in 3.2, um, 3.3, sorry, and you'll be able to see the, the points at which that sort of emerging draft plan will be shared um, with the board for comment and moving um, to input. Um, and as to be able to collectively meet that deadline of the 31st of January to get it into our government. Um, and I think just picking up on some of the points already, I think. We'll have a focus on um, simplification and consolidation of approach, but it, it's it's key that we get those milestones um, you know, refreshed and that we can um, I suppose demonstrate to a plan the unique contribution of HEIW and the benefit that we actually bring in delivering um, against those plans. So that's what I was gonna say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in which case I open it up for any comments or, or queries. Oh. Please excuse me, I'm new to the board. Can you just explain to me, Alan, why, in terms of the INT approach, firstly, <coughs> in terms of that diagram, why there is a, one solid arrow between the last two boxes? What does that mean different to the rest of the diagram? Is there a greater emphasis on that, or I, I don't understand why it's there? Okay, so um, I think in, in previous planning exercises, um, that the deans and deputies group wasn't in existence and um, so we're seeing that as a key part of um, I suppose within the internal approach of HEIW that they will be able to um, take an active role in um, sort of reviewing and revising the, the, the draft plan as it is being established um, to support the exec team um, with, with our previous So there is a significance more so than the others within that that process. Yeah, that is a, a change in approach to previous. Can I just ask then, uh, again, excuse my ignorance, in terms of our planning principles, in terms of our approach around innovation to our strategic approach, how are we capturing that in our planning principles? Um, uh, also influencing regulation and, and professional structures? I think those are important. If we're, if we've got a clear vision in order to do that, we've got to be very clear about our innovation within our strategic approach. Part of that needs to be influencing regulatory and professional structures. So that's not for now. I just leave it there for, for colleagues to consider. Thank you. 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 Uh, that we change what is captured here because I think the approach you've taken here is absolutely the right one. But for me, I think as we now go into the next planning cycle and report widely says that we're entering 
a very challenging period. And we as an organization need to make a focus on those key, key issues which we are responsible. The IMTP is absolutely a key driver. But I think from a finance perspective, what would be helpful going forward is if we can demonstrate back to board how the spend links to delivery of those key elements of the IMTP. It's just from the insurance point of view, we, we, this will develop. And I think once we are focused on that, accepting that I think NHS organizations will get knocked from one side to the next because of the financial situation we have to face, particularly after last week's budget and conversations that are now happening in the Treasury. Uh, I think we need to be as focused as possible in demonstrating that in all of this expenditure, we are delivering those key components and here's how we link it back. I think, it, I think that needs to be captured there somehow. Yeah. The value and benefit will be a real theme in this year's plan. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, we've had, um, you know, we're now into our fourth year. Um, I think we kind of we understand a lot more about how the organisation works, the fine and how the finances work, and you know we are much more established now. So I think that focus on not just developing things, but really delivering on those um, measurable benefits and the value added will be a real key theme for us. Mm -hmm. Can we go to the ask then? Um, and um, we'll press at the timeline. Um, can we approve this timeline? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Can we look at the planning principles? Um, Can we improve the planning principles? It's subject to the, 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 the comments. The oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Of course. Uh, and the finance, the approach to the finance plan? Yes. Is everybody content with those approvals? Yeah. 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 So just to note the first conversation about the plan will, will be a full planning session next month. Or how that's starting to emerge, the opportunity for board members to influence. We've approved the timeline. I mean, it's worth noting that it's actually very short. <laughs> 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 uh, it's very short and it's very helpful to have an on Friday two days um, for um, the board, board um, information or involvement. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, now, uh, Moira, yeah, um, are you going to present this one? I am, yes, definitely. Um, oh. Right. Okay, definitely. Uh, Messi, a papier de Hans, if that are the Uraria, uh, your poor, that I can see Pimonet, the Swartman, are Gaver, Nigeria. And we have my Cynllun Pimlynedd yn llwyd gwaith grŵp gorchwyl a gorffen y Llywodraeth. Cyhoeddwyd y cynllun yn Rhysterfod yn Is Awst, ac yn ei gweithio at cyfarfod hynny. Um, Moriad y cynllun yn bras, y cynllun Pimlynedd ydy i gynyddu'r ffocws ar weithredu'r gyfynion ar mwyn ag eiriau yn y gwasanaeth iechyd a'r gofal. My cynllun yn ei chlogeisio ac yn cynnwys a phwysig yn gweithio o gamau weithredu. Ac mae'n amlwg bod gan agig rhan allweddol chwarae o ran gweithredu'r cynllun. O, trwy'n ei gweithio cam gweithredu enwyr agig mewn naw fel dynod cyrff gyda atebolrwydd arweiniol. Ac yn, ynghyd â hyn, nid yw hefyd wedi asesu bod gan agig rôl i chwarae mewn 23 cam ellach. Um, mae'r camau um, Llyn nhw gan, gan fod ni atebolrwydd arweiniol wedi cael ei rhanhoi yn y papur ac yn cynnwys mesurau i hybu'r iaith Gymraeg, y Brwydleudeini, uh, ym Arfer Da, o fewn y gwasanaeth iechyd a'r gofal. 
canfod gwell data o ran mesur sgiliau staff yr weithlu um, a ble bod bylchau mewn sgiliau iaith uh, yn cael eu uh, darganfod i ofyn am cynnydd yn nifer o ddyrwyr sy'n graddio gyda sgiliau dwyth o bylchau hynny. Er mwyn sicrhau cynnydd yn y nifer o staff gyda sgiliau ddieithog, mae'r cynllun yn gofyn yn monitor, gos y targedau ac yn y pendraw os oes angen targedau uh, rhwymod ar gyfer uh, myfyrwyr dwyieithog. O ran y camau nesaf i agig, uh, rydym ni eisiau wedi creu tîm gweithredol i gefnogi y mateb uh, agig i'r cynllun. Mae'r tîm gweithredu eisiau wedi cwrdd. Uh, Byddwn hefyd yn ysgrifennu i'r Llywodraeth yn y Cymru i ofyn am fwy o'r ynylion o ran gweithredu'r cynllun. Felly i gloi, gwneud gwyddo'r ystyried yn papur uh, ac i nodi i gynnwys uh, sydd hwn os bod yma. But to say this is a very welcome program, um, but uh, we do need to think quite seriously about the implications for HERW because there are a number of them, they're a bit open ended at the moment, and they're also shared in partnership with others. Um, I think it will be useful to have um, an early uh, indication of what HEIW's involvement is actually going to be. Um, I don't know whether uh, you've got any thoughts about that, um, but it seems to me quite important. And potentially, this could um, be for us quite a significant um, resource uh, demanding area. Um, one of the really nice things about it is it's aim for patient and public benefit. Um, and I think it will be good if we could find a way to measure that uh, or to get some kind of sense of what's that, what, how it's received um, or is it making a difference? So, and um, I know there's anecdotal evidence that it does make a huge amount of difference for individuals, but the sort of quantum of that is what we're achieving, what we're aiming to achieve. Um, so anybody else like to, to comment? I just come back on that point from the um, chair. So, um, yeah, I think we certainly welcome the report because I think we do see this as being such a fundamental thing that we need to embed in all of our functions and it is a golden thread in the workforce strategy. So, um, this helps us really raise awareness of that and really crystallise some of those things. Um, we do need the devils in the detail as with all of these things. So, I think the steering group that we've got will be critical. And what I would anticipate happening now is that steering group crystallise what um, that means for us in terms of our NGP for next year um, in a much more tangible way so that, you know, again, alongside all the other things we've got to do, we can see exactly what that means in concrete terms as part of our process. So, um, yeah, we're not going to just put this into a, a sort of a dark cupboard somewhere. This is very much going to be sort of living as part of our plans. There is an element within it which picks up Tina's and concern about making sure that the culture mm. is also um, made available and, and part of the education and, and training offer. Um, and I think we would like to see that particularly enhanced in whatever we, we come to be able to do. I'll speak up for people can hear me, so please don't think I'm shouting. <laughs> um, on Reference 9, 10, 13, which talks about um, the median plans of workforce and doing some survey work on workforce amongst the organisations. We've got to 2025 to report on that. I think that's, that's a particular difficulty um, in how we would access that from other organisations. Is that going to come forward to us in the commissioning process or is that going to be part of the workforce? planning, development, training that we're actually going to be taking forward because that, that's a huge ask, isn't it, for us to deliver by 2025. If we're going to be able to have a strategy to implement um, commissioning programmes going forward, I think that really does need to come into our TP as an additional agenda item that we would have to build on in, in the next year. Thanks. 
John. Thank you very much, Chair. <coughs> um, and it's, uh, I worked on the Congress to touch us in terms of how we action the, the, this strategy and what actions are noted within the document. But I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to repeat what I said. The board would need to deliver a detailed delivery plan against those actions so that we know what outcomes to expect and when to expect <coughs> those against the, against the strategy that's been issued by West Coast government. So that we as a board again are comfortable that we say what we're doing when we're supposed to be doing it. So whether we call it a delivery plan or whatever, but we've got key milestones for us as a board to gain assurance. Thank you. Um, I just just had a message from one of our um, members of staff who's listening externally uh, to say that they can't hear very well. Um, I don't know, Tina, are you aware of that? Um, I got a message. So, so, okay, I'm on your So. Um, I'll just mention it. That yeah. specific yeah. message that the Hughes translation could be heard in public for us now, but that's now been fixed. Right. So has that been fixed? I'm just checking now. Is that, is that, is that now been fixed, the translation for extending? Can we the Zoom link? In I which, can Zoom link. I can log into Zoom. In which case, is, is there any way that we can make missed uh, um, part available to the public? That, um, they were able to hear. Well, it would be yes, it would be the room. The room would be recorded. Yes. Sorry to um, put across that, but it's just a few domestic things to sort out. Um, is there anybody else want to make a comment on this particular document? Because it's here for us to note. Um, but we, with the uh, caveat of wanting to know a little bit more about what this implies, I think we'll give it a, 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 a strong welcome mm -hmm. um, and our support um, as it progresses. Um, right. Can we now? Yes. Uh, <laughs> can we now move on to um, part four? But I've also had a message which says, can we now have a comfort break? <laughs> what, yes, yes. So what's the thinking on that? Yes. So comfort breaks are probably very brief. So it's... Um, Till 22. I don't know what this box says here. That's Hi, Hugh, I can hear you now. Hey, Fiona.
where um, we're going to start again now on part four, the agenda. I would like to apologize if people listening in have found it difficult to hear, um, particularly those of us at this end of the room, and I'll do my best to speak up. Um, but uh, let's move um, straight on now with 4.1, which is the Director of Finance report. Brianna, we're with you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the, the report sets out um, the reported financial position as of five. So we've reported an understand of £562,000. Um, there are tables on page three that detail um, where that is. Um, and the spend is happening across the main expenditure group from exec director portfolio. Um, we, the balance sheet is set out in the report, and I think it's positive to note that we've, we've been able to recover our PSPP position. And so we did have an issue with that in earlier months, but we are now exceeding the 95% target. Um, but I suppose the, the other thing that um, I wanted to share today is the Welsh Government has asked us to give early indication of any sort of potential funding hands back this year because of the, the position across NHS Wales. Um, so having um, I suppose reviewed all of our areas of commissioning expenditure, um, we've identified 5.8 million um, of underspend in respect of um, commissioning arrangements through our healthcare education contracts, broadly related to that spring cohort. And then a further 2.9 million um, identified as a result of delays to the anticipated September start date for our new commissioning arrangements. Um, so in, in two areas, we haven't been able to start those as anticipated. So the, the underspend has been sort of completely uh, reviewed and validated. So we're clear that nothing in respect of that will change. Um, so we're asking for support to be able to sort of return that to Welsh Government at this point in the year. Um, thank you, Helen. Um, I'm sure that members will want to uh, make some comments on this paper. So I will start with, um, with uh, Jill. Okay, thank you. Oh, I've also been on the speaker, so I'm not shouting about your behalf. I'm hoping that people can hear me now. So, um, yeah, thanks, thanks for, the, for the paper. Um, and I understand the regime in which we work, which is um, slightly um, more challenging than I've been used to, because obviously handing back money doesn't feel um, like somewhere we need to be with all the headlines in terms of um, recruitment. So I guess my question, I understand completely how we, we've got to that point, but I guess my question really is about our links with the universities and how we, because um, we've been in this position before, how are we able to get in this age of technology data that's so far out of date in some ways that doesn't allow us to make um, changes quickly? My understanding is that we ought to know students like that to push up a button and therefore be able to be a little bit more fleet of foot in terms of our forecasting. So um, that, that's my, um, my issue really in terms of this. And is it too late to find anything else to do with the second of the year? Um, I suppose the, so what we are reporting in, in a from a finance perspective, is that um, those returns that are part of our contract arrangements, and we are basing our finance position on that official return from the university, and then you know, taking a short amount of time really to be able to validate all of the, the information in there and make sure that it is accurate. So we're basing our financial position on, I guess, the what is stipulated in those sort of commissioning contracts. Um, I ask you to come in on whether you know, we get, um, I suppose, anecdotal evidence of that. And I know that we are doing a lot of work at the moment in terms of you know, trying to increase those numbers into programmes you know, as we become aware of that information. I think from a finance perspective, we need to make sure that we're validating that information and that we're only paying for it. 
Yes, to you on that particular point. Yes, there is a lot of conversation actually with PTIs in terms of recognizing your rights, Jim, in terms of having to have been absolutely saved in this respect. So what we can report is yes, that actually we do monitor the fill rates. And, and we've actually just got the situation to you of where we are currently on the fill rates after this September. And we anticipated that actually much, much sooner than that, because as we were in this situation where there was a bit of a bit of an increase of team recruitment into programs last year post COVID, but obviously this year we have seen a, a bit of a drop. But even as before we knew this actually now, what we have anticipated, and that we are we are that you mentioned spring cohorts, we were starting to see a difference in actually the spring cohort recruitment. And of course, this could be borne out as we've expanded our access. So we've now actually got sort of different um, universities that you deliver in this program as well. So you could say sort of that our split has obviously actually opened up actually more um widened that access actually to people from that locality who might have previously gone to Swansea or elsewhere. So we've got to look at that. But what we have been doing is looked at and worked actually extensively at the HEIs. And we started this work as you just after this last spring cohort to look at what we could do. So we've reviewed all of the communication and the recruitment the opportunities that it, um, universities undertake. And I have to say, it is extensive. When that was actually fed back to us, actually, they do an incredible amount of work to try and recruit you into that arena. But what we've done is actually we've taken that forward, not just taking it as red. It's about what we can do actually with HIW, but also looked at how people actually within our current workforce could actually step onto some of these programs too. And so we're looking at actually how we can um, you know refresh and renew our national campaigns. We're also looking at underrepresented groups. So we know what you sort of, and I'm not going to focus entirely <laughs> on that spring cohort, but we know what you that the demography of the people actually attending those courses. Is different to September. We've got a lot of graduates to come in the in um, September from school, and sometimes actually your more mature students are more likely to come in in the spring. So we're looking as to how we actually target, how we actually inform them about our programs, and there's an extensive piece of work there. The spring cohort is a very big focus for us, um, and that's a dedicated area. But actually, we're looking at underrepresented groups as well across Wales. So where are the other pockets of areas that we can look into in terms of care leavers actually and other aspects as well. And the other one that we are currently looking at is overseas recruitment. Now traditionally, what we've done is actually go to international recruitment for poor in others for registered nurses. Yes. And we're now starting to work too, with universities that in the conversations that um that basically is happening is that you want to do what is within respect of students coming through as well. Thank you. So that's um, in a sense looking forward because it's going to help us in the current situation. But it, we're doing a lot of work in the current situation as well. I mean, an example is learning to specify. Um, Thomas, then, Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, so, in terms of the paper, I have to say, in terms of what we're expected to do with the board. Um, it does leave me very uncomfortable to agree to some of the expectations within the paper. Um, if, if my first question would relate to the seven million, I think we have a new path to answer the question around why now, why at minus five. I feel uncomfortable about that. I think we should be looking at ways in which um, we can perhaps be a little bit more innovative. It's for the executive team, team to think about that. But unless I hear something different, I, I'm uncomfortable about that. Um, I guess my key question is, we should as an organization, and I'm not a financial person, so I may be complete talking in absolute ignorance, but we should have as an organization at least three, if not four years, financial data that we can do some modeling on. So we should be able to have modeled what factors impact on our spending. And so my question is, why isn't it that we've got scenarios whereby we look at that model so that influences our decisions proactively, rather than what this paper is, a lot of retrospective work, so that we're able to use that modeling data to say, well, in 
In the past, we've known what attrition has been, we've known what fill rates have been, we've known X number of factors that have influenced our spend. So that should then that should then influence and predict our decision making. Has that been done? If so, it would be interesting to see that modeling, which is why I think we should defer a decision at month five to see that first as to how we can use that economic or financial modeling to inform some board decisions. I don't know, I just wanted to come back. Come back. No, no, I just want to respond to that one as well. I mean, so basically, we take a zero, zero based approach to our budget setting and all of our plan. So we have um, all these budgets in education commissioning by individual student place, modeled the whole piece through every step of three, we can actually project over five years. So yeah, absolutely, we take into account attrition, we take into account bursary taker. This is year one, so this is as a result of um, students that we are anticipating into year one of those programs. And we have taken a, a decision and that we will adopt uh, an approach that we're not going to plan to fail. So we we cost into our plan all of the places um, that we would like to commission. So we completely resource that commissioning plan. So as time moves on and we are aware that you know, we don't fill all of those places, our financial planning is sophisticated enough to move that um, scenario through the following years that those people would be in programmes. So we are we are flexing those figures regularly um, through that scenario planning, but this is purely as a result of our assumption that we will 100% fill those places, and that sort of falling slightly short of that is generating a lot of underspend. So, so I think you're absolutely right, and so I think perhaps we need a more in-depth session with you, John, to understand the, um, I suppose, uh, unique nature of the HEIW financial situation because of those academic cycles that drive it, but not only the places, but also the choice of anniversary, which is another factor underneath that, which we cannot control. Um, and we've seen a huge you know, decrease over the last 12 months in the take up of the, the bursary, which just impacts like that on our financial position. And yet, you know, we could take planning assumptions that were quite different and be in an overspend position where we've got to stop students go into these programs because we've overspent so we have got that sophistication i think we need to and you know as a new board member you're quite right we need to sit down and make sure you've got um a level of understanding of that 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 helps make sense of this particular decision we still have retained flexibility around that seven million so we've still got flexibility to do innovative things this year um and also um i think when we get on to next month and the impact of some of the fill rates that we're currently seeing emerge into this year's program, we might have even more flexibility that we want to discuss as a board as well. Um, and certainly, um, one of the things I was mentioning to Ruth yesterday is in October board development session, we'll bring back a broader paper on where we're currently at with those commissioning costs and the financial choices that we've got as a board. But my, my concern, if we don't give this £7 million pounds back to Welsh Government at the moment, is we do not have any plans to spend that now this year because of the way that the academic cycles go, which you understand because they're always you know, well in advance of our, our plans. And I feel that um, in the context of the financial situation in the NHS, we have to let other people make use of that £7 million because I appreciate the pressures that are on centrally in, in the central NHS resources. And we are not going to disadvantage our delivery this year by giving that seven million pound back because that March cohort has already um, been affected into our financial position for this year um, without us being able to do anything about it for the rest of the year. So, so, so yes, absolutely agree. Financial modelling is key. Um, we're getting better and better that every year, but then new things come in every year as well. And, you know, the cost of living issues this year, how will that impact on student behaviour? If the bursary continues at the same rate, how will that impact on student behaviour? So there are variables that we do also need to allow for within that, in that, in that process as well. But I would be, um, I suppose, anxious if we couldn't support Welsh Government with that seven million at this point in the year. I guess, I hear what you're saying. I guess if we look at it ex from an external position, we are continually hearing in the media and um, politically, the workforce pressures. Yes, 
there are service pressures, but there are major workforce pressures. The perception that that has on us as a board of sending back 7 million when there are significant workforce pressures, it even as to, as I'm concerned, it's perception, and we may be able to explain it, but the perception externally does not look good. Well, I think unfortunately we've got a, we've had a very open and transparent dialogue with Welsh Government all through the last four years where we've frequently had some of these um, issues in terms of our undulating underspend and I think that actually they appreciate the fact that we are open and transparent about it so that actually employers can make use of that money then in terms of workforce pressures because we're not the only people that can do something about the workforce pressures we're obviously the bit that can do the all Wales strategic stuff but equally you know if that money is going into um, supporting winter pressures in any way or the community care capacity project or any of those other things then that's actually helping the workforce pressures as well so you know, I think that um, you know we've got that mature relationship with Welsh Government because of the unique, unique nature of our financial um, framework within, uh, within HIW, but actually, you know, that hasn't been the case up until this point, John. Um, I'm going to ask Tina and Jonathan to um, present their okay. points, and then perhaps we can take them together. Thanks. My question is in relation to um, the anticipated uh, delays and start dates with regards to dispersed and distance learning, particularly mm -hmm. about Bangor um, University, maybe not being able to call off the response of the regulator. And I just wondered, given that it's about 2.9 million, and I know, I know the challenges that if you were to reallocate that to another project where that would be, but we are in a situation potentially um, where we won't be meeting those um, even in the March. And I just wondered whether there's an option here to look at um, an enhanced return to practice across the professional groups, whereby people have left the profession to come in because we've already got those programmes. Um, we should be able to offer um, the return to practice courses. The other issue, I would say, is that if we look at the care home sector, which also has um, quite a number of health or, or social care work, workforce now, whether or not we could look at enhancing the skill sets of those individuals on a nursing programme. We already have the OU, which has had an existing contract, looking at a part-time approach to see whether or not we could see if that's an area where we might extrapolate um, individuals who are keen to go into maybe a level two or level three healthcare support worker program and then inspire them to actually be a potential group of people who might want to go on to that distance learning or dispersing distance learning program should bank come in so what i'm saying is that i do know that there have people that have left and i will say nursing but not just nursing physiotherapy that maybe could be enhanced through an active return to practice program coming in to do a return to practice still gets them back into the workforce but um the expenditure on that is that and i know from previous years they get they get funded to do that but also they get a, a financial um, package i think it was about a thousand pounds per student to complete that just wonder whether we've looked at those potential issues of how we might do that so as far as the return to practice program, so yeah, just said currently exists, but as you recall, so yeah, yeah, but as you recall, so that is what we have had is that you can have the register, the temporary register is extended, um, and that was opened up, and we've done a, a huge amount of work because we are working with some of those registrants and what do you want to come back? I think it comes back to a sort of um, you know a previous conversation about it. when we actually do want to bring bring people back into the return to practice mm -hmm. program. And through that uh, temporary register, what we have seen is that they want to work in specific areas, and and that has been a challenge as well. But the number of people that you've taken up for certain practice programs is quite small. It's quite small. And so to look to okay. I need to bring Jonathan in. I'm conscious of the time. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, you're going to take over the conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, we know in the planning that goes on in this building that in the course of the year there is movement and we see it sometimes in procurement we're seeing it in four variation orders that will be asked to approve the next meeting 
So despite what goes into those planning assumptions, sometimes there is movement and sometimes there are, well, usually an increase in cost. So if this 7 million is taken out, looking ahead now to the rest of the financial year, how certain are we when we get to the end of this financial year, maybe around February and early March, that we're not going to face some additional costs that we wouldn't have anticipated? Because the four variation orders that we're being asked to let them get for the next meeting uh, were signed in February and March uh, of this year, so uh, towards the end of the financial year. So are we certain, A, that we have the wriggle room to cope with any additional costs that may come at us? And B, do you anticipate there being any other understep that may have to be returned to Welsh government beyond that seven million? Yeah, so um, I, as, as reasonably confident as I can be at this point that in handing back the seven million that we're not leaving ourselves exposed to financial risk. Um, and I think that is in the context of um, the sort of September in this sort of autumn cohort and the intelligence we have around and um, the potential for further underspend. You know, we have within our plans a range of um, different things that we've considered as an exec team to bring forward any sort of non recurrent expenditure that will support our future programme. So we've already um, looked at those innovative approaches and anything that we can bring forward. Um, on the current into this year. So, you know, and there could be slippage in that program as well. So, I don't think we are exposing ourselves to any financial risk of being able to break even at your end. If anything, there, there could be sort of future. So, further could be further slippage where money is sent back to Russia. Alex, do you want to come and talk about Jonathan Yeah, I think. Um, so this is, a, this is a point in time with the micro-implementing my, my position. Um, there's a decision that we brought to the board probably a lot earlier than we normally would on the basis that we understand the pressures right across the system. And it is imperative on us, I think, to, if we don't think we're going to be able to spend that many on our plans for this year, um, on some of those workforce pressures, but we have to um, declare that um, because I know that all of the budgets are being asked for slippage and opportunities <laughs> and to, to, to prioritise things. I think what I would suggest is in October at our board development session, we do need to have a broader conversation about what the financial outlook for the next six months looks like, because as I said, we are aware, for example, that some of the fill rates this year on programmes are not what we thought they would be. Um, and so that will need to be modelled into our finances for the next six months. Um, as you just said, John, in terms of what does that mean for us then? There's a lot of action in place with university colleagues at the moment to try and make sure that those fill rates are as high as they possibly can be. Um, we'll get to a point by the 1st of November where, you know, that will be it and we'll know for definite. Um, and then we'll need to also make assumptions about how many of those are going to take the bursary and how many aren't. So I think at that point, we do need that conversation about all of the other things that we've got. We have been taking more risks this year about using um, some of the underspend to pump prime some of the big workforce developments we want to take forward. So, for example, the strategic mental health workforce plan, we've got an allocation ready to support the early implementation of those. Similarly, with our pharmacy undergraduate placements. So, we've been really flexible around a lot of our developments in terms of things that we perhaps ordinarily would have asked Welsh Government to support and fund. Um, where we can use that flexibility we've got to support them. So we have got that flexibility, but we, we will have also another uh, discussion about any other understanding and we will need to um, have that full discussion in October, I think, before we make any decisions then at our November board. So that would be my suggestion about the way forward. Do, do, um, is there an imperative to make a decision about the £7 million pounds sooner? Or can it can, can it wait? Because I think you have picked up those different concerns around the table to understand this properly, um, and to make sure that not only the board understands it, but the position is understood more widely. I think the um, the imperative has come from from Welsh government in that they are sort of currently um, looking at every way in which they they can um, support the system and bridge a financial gap. Um, so 
I think that was the, the imperative for us to be able to declare, you know, this at an early stage. Um, because I think you know, they're in a, in a position where they are trying to um, sort of bridge a financial challenge and for us to not put this into the pot now and then declare it in a few months time you know, would also probably not be seen favorably. And we've had a very good relationship with them over the last four years in that they've afforded that, us that flexibility where we can return money when we haven't used it on the front but they're not trying to reduce our base time. So, that resource is with us to be able to resource our commissioning plan. Oh. Um, sure, if I may, please. Um, so I, I accept that we need to consider the wider picture. I, I, I get that. But ultimately, we are accountable as a board for what we do uh, and the decisions that, that we make. Um, <clears throat> and that has to be within the wider context. That's so why I, I get that. For my own assurance, then, or reassurance, can I ask Alex directly? Are, we, are you able to reassure the board that everything has been done possible to utilise our budget to the maximum capacity that we can at the moment, and therefore within this position, having done all that we can? I absolutely can. Okay. Absolutely can, because it's a constant, it's not a new thing, John. It's a constant issue for us as a team, and something we're always looking at opportunities to use that resource as flexible as we can to make sure that we deliver on the resources as precious. In the circumstances where um, we've had that assurance, um, we have also had an assurance that at our October meeting we will explore this in depth because it's not the first time we've had to do this. We've actually been around this loop before and we didn't want to be back here. Um, and I think um, that we really need to find a way forward which would yeah. satisfy the board that um, we aren't going to be here again, um, uh, at least not to our own um, actions. Yeah, I think that's the key, isn't it? Because there are variables here that we have to make assumptions about. We can't control them, and it's the quality and the sophistication of the planning assumptions that we make that, that drives this. So yeah, that's why we need to involve the board. And, and in that, can we pick up the sort of the suggestions to the residents and similar suggestions and see that there are, there are innovative ways of wider, maybe board members can think of wider potential and that we haven't done. So I'm happy to engage as far as to make some of the time here, but I, I do know where there are some questions and potential issues. Do you want final word? Yeah, just, just two very quick things that perhaps we could bring back to the October session is how we get the fill rates higher. So how can we work as a whole system to attract people into those jobs? And um, the second thing, some reassurance on, and I understand that the contracts, the way they're written, but there must be something that we can do to work with the universities to get our information correct. So on that basis, are you prepared to approve um, the action? even if with regret that we have to do so um, and an understanding that there is an understanding with Welsh Government um, about the um, background issues here and we would like to explore it in October in a way where we don't find ourselves back here again. Yeah? Thank you. Well, you will note that we're now past time and um, thought that was an important discussion and that we should have it and we have to have it. And so you'll forgive me, but I think we're probably going to take another 20 to 30 minutes to complete this agenda. If I'm in your hands, I'll do my best. Um, the next item is the integrated performance report for September, dated September 2022. And this is in fact a, an item to note. Um, but um, we have a list with you too. Yeah. So um, the paper attached is the um, it is broadly the quarter one performance report. Um, but in terms of strategic objectives, where um, uh, things have moved on and um, we have been supplemented with more up to date um, activity information about about. I suppose where those objectives are in terms of achievement and milestones. Um, 
So it's um, just pleasing to note that we're making good progress um, against the majority of the strategic objectives, but that there have been some delays noted on specific um, objectives, particularly nursing workforce plan, dental workforce plan, and our work with WEMAT, which is the Welsh Institute of Minimally um, Invasive Therapy. Um, there are some common themes coming through, um, so we are addressing those as a team and um, I suppose being recruitment and some procurement delays and we are putting plans in place to be able to mitigate um, the impact of those for the rest of the year. Um, the education and, and training activities presented and the commissioning activity continues to be positive um, even though there is an, an increase in the underlying numbers um, but we are just trying to focus on some particular hotspots. So I know we just had a discussion about the spring um, cohorts, but also LD nursing. Um, yeah, so and the quality, quality monitoring um, continues and is um, being sort of enhanced and improved you know, as we move um, through this cycle. So I'm going to stop there and ask uh, any so just clarify for us that the uh, shape of this report is is um, being developed it's it's in development yeah. um and uh, alex do you want to comment on that yeah um i think over the last few months because we've had this sort of report <coughs> for about 18 months two years i think since um uh nicola developed this with john hilthouse assistance actually wasn't it originally but I think we are conscious that it now needs a refresh um, and so one of the proposals is that we do that over the next three months and that we bring that back to um, board along with our INTP for next year so that the two things go together. Um, I think we'd really like some IM input into that um, so I think over the next couple of months if you I know John you've had a particular involvement before in the performance committee um, and Jonathan, you might be interested as well. So I think it'd be really helpful if we have some IM input into that because I think um, it's been, we, we started from scratch on performance management, I think in HOW, we didn't have any framework to build on. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's a good time <coughs> to take stock and to make sure that it does support the delivery of our MGP and our core business for next year um, in a more direct way. And I think we're conscious of that as an executive team as well. Um, and I think it would be excellent if more members could be involved because there's a lot of experience. Um, but obviously, particularly if John and Jonathan are able to, that would be, that would be great. Um, John, did you want to come back? Yeah, I mean, Chair. Um, so I accept the point that this is a directive and that we need to develop a, a performance report that's different to many other organisations. I, I, I get that point. I guess for us as a board, what I would be looking for in a, in a performance report are, are, are questions in terms of ones that I wrote out. You know, what are the, the expected successful deliverables, uh, and what are those, those looking like, and whether there's any deviation from what we expect in our performance, or whether there's any risk attached to that deviation. Um, and also, are there any matters that should be brought to the board attention in terms of that deviation or risk in terms of, of, of performance? Um, I guess I, what I liked about it is that it's linked to our strategic objectives and the sorry, 56 ob objectives and the six strategic aims. So I like that element. I'm not sure that we're nailing at the moment the performance element of it, where in terms of the board, it's about what are we doing, how are we doing it, are there any deviations, and what should we make the board aware of in that deviation? What I seem to see here is, you know, where we are with various very impressive projects, I have to say, very impressive, um, and it's commendable to the teams, the extent of what's taking place. But I'm not sure that's for board, that detail, I think that's, that's a really helpful reflection. Um, and I've, I've been through the beta process, obviously, as it as it's evolved. Um, but and I have two pages of comments which I won't go through, um, Chair. 
Um, but just one thing, if you read this cold and you didn't have the finance report alongside, you think we were a quarter of a million underspent. There's, there's very little, there's nothing about our returning seven million, there's nothing to bring it up to date. Um, and I just feel that, that because of the time lag, and I understand that this is at the end of June, if you read it cold, you would have completely the wrong impression. So I just went out for what we can do to kind of um, make up better for the average like it's really well. Yeah. That could be built into the sort of thinking. Um, this is why I think it's all board members may well have experience, which is valuable, but if you can go on and do who so then what and I certainly will bring something back to board development before I find my base and new in I think yeah I think we, we're conscious of all of the points that you you've raised as well and it's um, so um, can we note this paper and and welcome the work that will be done to show her on something which we feel is is more reflective now of, of our performance. I think, Chair, sorry to be, but I think it actually asked for us to take assurance from it. And I'm not sure we can take assurance, but we certainly can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's take 4.3 now, which is, um, I hope, a relatively straightforward paper. And um, we are asked here to approve um, changes which I'm sure you're already very familiar with. Um, to personal and on committees. I don't think I read, sorry. Um, but so we have to approve the reappointment of the existing <coughs> NAC and ECQC members as detailed within paragraph three, if you have that in front of you. Um, and presumably that um, details that I will no longer be a member of um, audit committee. Sorry, Ryan. Should we go through this? Okay. 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 And can we go through the others and come back to that one? But so we need to approve the appointment of John Gowan as a new member of the Education Committee. Are you content with that? Yes. Yep. We need to approve the appointments of the chairs of the Audit and Insurance Committee and the Education Committee um, as detailed in the paper. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And to um, approve the appointments of the vice chairs as detailed within the paper. Yes. Yes. Yep. And to go back now, apologize for the delay, to approve the reappointment of the existing members of those committees as detailed within the proposal. Yes? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can I just um, comment before we leave that item that um, Devin's included um, a paragraph uh, to make clear the um, arrangements in the case of conflicts of interest. And I think that is an important paragraph and we should note it. Right, thank you. Um, if we move on, the board is asked to note under 4.4 the corporate risk register and strategic risks. Tommy, do you want to say something about this briefly? Yes, very briefly. I'm trying to add, 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 I'm trying to or an the risk, and a quantum inventory risk, and in a bit, or by the with an amber worth, 
my risk for the main asset of your gallows. Um, or an risk stratego, a committed to it, and the risk came out no least clever, can a board act minds and keep the end of the night stratego in IFTP, especially Papa Rimondi and Miss Kurdi on the scope of that. Yeah, I think um, just reflecting on the conversation previously in the meeting, I think that um, the, the commission at risk is something that has been a need to appear on the corporate risk register. Um, the, the spring cohort was one issue, but I think that what we're seeing emerging is another issue, and I think we need to. Um, probably see that if you want to do a register now um, from a corporate perspective. So I think just we want the board to not Thank think you. the way they came out of it. Yes, I agree. Um, Sean? Yeah, can I just make um, a suggestion? It's helpful for me to go through the risk register. I was very much out to send it to try to see it was, was, was helpful. I think what would be helpful is that the, the risk register includes timelines as to when mitigations are put in place, when we as a board can expect those mitigations to have an impact or not. I think that would be helpful. Um, and also, I'm familiar, again, for helping board decisions, what is the trend with some of these risks? So are these risks getting worse? Are they improving? I think information around that would be helpful. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, we need the um, support for insurance and the strategic risks for information. So, can I just, um, with regards to trend, the, the cover paper does highlight uh, the trend between the last other reports presented to the board. Yes. Uh, can you just explain yeah, so what, 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 I, what I would suggest, all it says is, is that there's a narrative in terms of some of the risks where there's been a change. And for some of them, the whole of the risk register, um, it would be useful to see when there are mitigations, the impact of those mitigations, uh, when we would expect them, and when is the trend of this risk. You know, it's only a case of an hour, I put down the holidays. That provides us as a board, when we're moving in the right direction, the mitigations that we've got in place are the right ones, and we can expect them by such and such a date. At the moment, I'm not able to say, well, are these effective or not? I trust executive colleagues, but I think collectively we'll be helpful. That will be helpful. Okay. Um, item 4.5 on the agenda, in committee decisions. Um, Daniel, this is a lot of you. So, um, is that we were informed that um, the um, Aberystwyth University had opened um, a new school and the official opening of that is tomorrow and I think we still attend it. I'm not too sure if there is a board member because I couldn't go and share. Okay, I'll send it. You have to go at short notice. But no. um, and also to note um, that uh, the committee received an update regarding the you know, fresh and streamlining and we'll be aware from previous um, agenda items that there were some issues on um, streamlining individuals into working um, if they were in receipt of a, a bursary and um, we agreed that it would be maintained for nurses, midwives, physicians, associates and operating department practitioners 
However, that in accordance with um, the adult health professionals and the agreement of the directors of adult health professionals and mental health schools, streamlining will no longer take place for that particular group. And I think that's significant proportionate. And um, I don't see what's to report on the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is one paper for noting in section five. Um, shared Services Partnership Committee Assurance Report, just to say that um, I think we now have an agreement that we receive the support from, from Shared Services and they also receive ours in exchange. Um, is that right? So, 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 so all NHS organisations receive their minutes because we all receive the services from one of our services. And they ask us to let every board notice that that report. Thank you. Uh, any other urgent business? In which case, I uh, bring this meeting to a close um, and um, note that the board development session will be held on the 27th of October here, and the board to be held on the 24th of November via Zoom. I thank you for your patience and for uh, staying with us to the end, but I think it's been important that we've had. To the discussions that we've had um, and time for them. So thank you. With that, I will now resolve we move into the closed session meeting of the board. So just, just to correct that, that board meeting will be held with a physical meeting, so it's all so apologies to that actually on the agenda. Sorry. Yeah. It was a mic that was there, but it was a physical meeting.